And a welcome back to our number two of Penny Few Thoughts. I'm Jim Turpin, and as I promised, uh, Rodney Davis is here in the studio with me. Uh, Rodney is the Republican candidate for Congress in Illinois' 13th District. He faces a Democrat, David Gill, in November. And this uh, race, of course, is to fill the Tim Johnson seat. Johnson dropped out of the race after winning the primary. So a lot of things to uh, talk to Rodney about, and uh, we would like to have you participate, those of you in the audience. This is the first time we've had the opportunity to have him on. This is an important uh, job that he's uh, seeking, and uh, I'm sure you have questions about uh, what's going on in Washington and what he would do to try to uh, change things or make things better in certain areas if he gets to Washington. So... Call us at 356-9397 or 1-800-223-9397. You can email us, talk at wdws.com. Well, Rodney, uh, thanks for uh, coming by. We appreciate it. I know you've been a busy guy. This uh, district uh, is uh, a a good-sized one, but uh, you were telling me before we went on the air, you've been used to working a district that's uh, about twice that size. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Um, now, don't get me wrong, 14 counties is big. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're right, compared to what we were talking about earlier is my previous job working for Congressman Shimkus, who's now going to represent um, half of your listening area. Uh, he's got 33 counties in his new district, and the previous one that I worked in for him over the last 10 years had 30 counties. Uh, but, you know, I'm excited about the opportunity in the new 13th district and the 14 counties that, that make it up. Uh, and, you know, I live in Taylorville. It's right in the middle of the district. So I'm going to try and be everywhere I possibly can be. Because it only takes me about an hour and a half max to get to any end of the district. And I think that's a very good uh, travel time. I want to talk to you about some of the uh, things going on in Washington, obviously. Uh, today they announced the... Uh, the, the Supreme Court uh, announced a, a ruling on uh, Arizona immigration law, but the one I want to talk to you about is the one they did not announce yet. I guess it's going to happen on uh, Thursday, and that would be the uh, the health care reform uh, law. And um, uh, Romney has indicated that uh, the first day he gets in, or the first hour he gets in there, he would try to repeal it if indeed it was uh, still existed by then. No one knows what the Supreme Court's going to do. What's your feeling about that? Would you uh, would you be up for a repeal, or are there certain sections of that law that uh, are important and and should be in there? If uh, even if they don't uh, endorse the entire law, or if they they knock away the mandatory insurance, uh, which is uh, one of the stickiest items in there, I guess. But uh, what's your feeling about the, this uh, so-called Obamacare? That's a great question. Um, I'm a repeal and replace uh, type of candidate. I think Obamacare stretches too far. Uh, you know, any bill, any piece of legislation has some good points to it, but the overall impact that Obamacare is going to have on this country is going to be a $2.6 trillion boondoggle. And what scares me the most is that we would then cede control of where and when to seek medical treatment to, to faceless bureaucrats. And I've got some history with my family uh, of cancer. My wife's a 13-year colon cancer survivor. And i got to tell you, I, I'm glad I had control in my family, my wife, and I had control of, of her medical destiny. She was misdiagnosed at age 26 for uh, months. And then when diagnosed, she was diagnosed incorrectly. And eventually, because we had the ability to pick and choose doctors, we were able to get away from the primary care doctor that, that wasn't treating her and go to a gastrointestinal doctor who finally found her tumor after thinking he would find Crohn's disease at the colonoscopy. So after the tumor was found, a week later, she had surgery, and a week, and a week after that began her first of her six months of chemotherapy, and she's doing great today. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, you don't want a committee or uh, some somebody in a far-off place making those decisions. Well, you're absolutely right, and, and I think of all... I can remember uh, 10 years ago, HMO reform was a, was a big issue in health care delivery. And what I see Obamacare, and more importantly, a single-payer system that uh, even goes beyond Obamacare would create, would be a one government-run giant HMO. And I don't think Americans want that. The uh, mandatory uh, 
provisions in, in the health care uh, bill seem to be the stickiest ones, and I, I think they're almost certain to uh, to throw that out, declare that uh, unconstitutional. Uh, would you would you agree with that part of it? Uh, I mean, the the part that interests me about that is that it uh, you know if if you don't want to do it, let's say they make it mandatory. If you don't want to do it, the fines are practically nothing. They're certainly going to be less than the insurance premiums. Right, and that's the absurdity of the bill as a whole. And and I agree with you. I think the Supreme Court will, at a minimum, throw out the individual mandate, which puts into question the entire piece of legislation. Um, but you know what I'm hearing in the 14 counties that make up the 13th district is that you know those who can, who are going to be tasked with creating jobs to help our economy in this district are afraid of the uncertainty of Obamacare. You know, one one business uh, would has mentioned to me that they cannot begin to hi- begin to plan to invest uh, in hiring more people until they understand what their true costs are. Now, this year, if Obamacare stands, this year the fines could be minimal. And when they see that it's not working, then come in and raise those fines up to make people buy insurance mm-hmm. that they may or may not be able to afford. It's that uncertainty that truly needs to be addressed in this country. And that's the only way we're going to get our economy going and create the jobs that it's going to take to get us out of this economic uh, these economic doldrums. Okay, let's uh, take a call here. This is uh, Brett. Uh, good morning, Brett. You have a question for uh, Rodney Davis. Yes, I do. Uh, good morning, Mr. Davis. Uh, um, my question is kind of about the immigration uh, and the Supreme Court decision today and you know, it's probably rightfully slow that the uh, Arizona may have been stepping on federal toes, but I don't think you'd find anyone that would argue that the federal government has failed to do its job in terms of, A, securing our border, or B, dealing with uh, immigration reform. Um, I, my main question, I guess, uh, revolves around the fact that in 1965, uh, they uh, repealed what was known as the Reed Johnson Act, and, and now legal immigration has blossom to over a million legal immigrants a year. Um, is there any chance of, of reining that back in to get it to a more manageable number uh, to where we have a net zero immigration? Because that's how you're going to uh, get a tight job market and uh, uh, clean up uh, unemployment and, and uh, start getting uh, salaries and wages back up. I'll uh, hang up and listen for your answer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Brad. Very good. Uh, are you aware of the, uh, the Supreme Court ruling this morning? I haven't had a chance to read it in detail, but what did they throw out? Well, they out? basically uh, struck down uh, most of it as saying that this is a, a federal uh, problem and should be uh, handled by uh, somebody other than the, the states. They they left uh, some things uh, in there. In fact, I got an email from a listener this, this morning and said uh, the most controversial part of the law, which was the reason that Eric Holder had uh, sued Arizona in the first place, was not overturned. So the local police officers can still check a person's immigration status while enforcing other laws if reasonable suspicion exists that the person is in the United States illegal. So evidently that is still a go, but uh, for the most part it was just, uh, they they said this is a Fed job and not a state job. Uh, Interesting. You know, I've talked about throughout this whole process and uh, before and after I was nominated to, to run for Congress, you know, the first thing we need to do in immigration reform is to secure the borders. And that means securing the, the borders between uh, Mexico and the United States and Canada and the United States. And any discussion of comprehensive immigration reform that, that Brett was addressing in his question has to include that as a top priority. You know, what I look forward to doing is if I'm blessed enough to be elected in November, I truly want to participate in comprehensive immigration reform debates. You know, we need to address immigration as a whole, and I think the question that he asked in regards to the overall impact of legal immigration versus illegal immigration is a good one, and that's something I want to I want to talk about, and I want to learn more about, and I want to be able to have a say in, in how we go about putting together a system that doesn't punish those who want to legally immigrate immigrate to this country uh some of the the most uh some of the best events you could ever go to are swearing in ceremonies of new citizens in mm-hmm. this country yeah i've been to some of those uh here here and locally and oh, yeah. uh, it's uh, quite impressive and uh, very emotional it is very very patriotic mm-hmm. that people want to become members of our country want to become citizens of our country uh 
but we also have to address the overall impact of illegal immigration. And when we do, then we're going to be able to truly solve some of the problems that, that continually get kicked kicked down the road. You know, these same issues that we're talking about today regarding illegal immigration are the same issues that, that we talked about 10 years ago. And what, what did you think of uh, Obama's uh, immigration uh, pronouncement the other day, which uh, most a lot of people, I shouldn't say most, uh, I don't know what everyone's thinking about this, but most thought was simply for the campaign and uh, not much else. You know, I, I completely agree. You know, it was nothing but a political ploy to try and get votes. And, and that's sad because we have the ability in this country to to lead. And I don't see leadership coming out of Washington. And I want to make sure that when we talk about overall immigration policy, that we put together a real, true, comprehensive plan that doesn't include amnesty and includes securing the border as our number one priority. Then we can address the intricacies of who, how, and when. Uh, you know, I also I agree that there are some people here in this country through no fault of their own who are brought here illegally by their parents, and that need those those uh, citizens or those individuals need to be a part need to be addressed in overall immigration reform, comprehensive immigration reform. I guess no surprise here, but a Gallup poll asked the question of uh, Hispanics. Do you approve or disapprove of President uh, Obama's decision to block the deportation of undocumented young Latinos? And 82% approved of that, 16% uh, uh, did not. Uh, The big headline on this story in USA Today this morning, Latinos strongly backing Obama. We're at 356-9397. Uh, Mr. Bond, uh, shall we take about a two-minute break here? That's all we need. And uh, then uh, Rodney Davis uh, right after that. So uh, give us a call if you have a question or a comment at 356-9397. My guest is uh, Rodney Davis. Uh, Rodney is the Republican candidate for Congress in Illinois' 13th uh, District. He'll be facing a David Gill in November. If you have a question or a comment uh, for him, uh, jump right in. Well, uh, Gil has called you a Washington insider. In other words, you are part of the problem. Uh, what's your answer to that? Are you an insider? I, I find that laughable. You know, that, that press release came out about 10, sec, 10 seconds after I got the nomination on May 19th. <laughs> so, you know, that, I, I kind of knew that was coming. You know, I've never worked in Washington you know, I've spent my career uh, working here in Illinois for Congressman Shimkus for the last 16 years, helping countless constituents break through the bureaucratic red tape of Washington, helping local leaders throughout the 30 counties that he represents, you know, find out how they can cost effectively partner with the federal government to address issues that the federal government should address, you know, new roads, bridges, clean drinking water, sewage treatment. I mean, those are issues, common sense issues that the federal government should address. Uh, my perspective is a Illinois perspective and a district-wide perspective. But I also believe that that same experience is going to give me this a very small learning curve once I get to Washington because I'm, I've am i already worked within the federal bureaucracy and I think I'd be able to hit the ground running out in Washington uh, and, and be able to have an impact on some of those major decisions that need to be made. Is that why you were picked as opposed to the other uh, folks uh, that were up there trying to get this uh, job when the uh when you had all those uh, meetings and uh, people finally decided on you over the others, or was that because of your experience, do you think? Well, I would like to think so. Um, I would like to think that uh, we successfully, uh, you know, convinced those uh, those individuals who supported me that my experience would allow me to put together not only a winning campaign, but also allow me to be a leader immediately upon stepping foot in Washington. And not just a leader or a, a congressman who's going to vote the right way, but one who's going to go out and try and get more votes and convince others that what we feel is important here in the 13th District of Illinois is important to America. And that's the type of leader I want to be, and, and I think that's one of the reasons they picked me. I want to talk to you more about that in just a bit, about how can a new congressman get there and actually get anything done as a freshman. But we go back to the phones for uh, Don. Hello, Don. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. What's up? Uh, first off, Mr. Davis, I-, I hope you win because you're a Republican. And uh, I only say that because uh, I think this state <laughs> needs more Republicans. Uh, but I-, I am appalled that a state has to go to the Supreme Court to allow the police 
Tufflers to ask someone if they're from the state. It always reminds me of the comedian Bill Engel. Here's your sign. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got to say. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Don. Thanks, Don. You know, and, and that's why I think we need a change in the White House, and uh, I'm going to fully support Mitt Romney to uh, to be our next president. Well, back to this uh, business about a freshman uh, congressman. Uh, how can you uh, get anything done? You've already said that you would uh, like to, uh, to be a leader and go out and, and uh, solicit uh, support from others. And uh, I guess that's the way you, you get things done, to get a, a majority that you need. But uh, I think people are people like, like uh, listening to this radio station are generally disenchanted with uh, Washington and uh, disgusted uh, with them and uh, this lack of uh, bipartisanship on uh, really critical issues that affect everybody. They just haven't been able to... They, you mentioned kicking the can down the road. I told Bill Black a little while ago, the can is pretty well shattered. They're going to have to get a new can. They've <laughs> kicked it so far down the road so many times. But uh, how would a, a freshman go in there and get much accomplished? Well, you know, that's why you need somebody who has some experience working within the federal bureaucracy, who understands, you know, that they understands what Washington's about without being enamored once they get there. You know, I've never worked in Washington, but I've been out there for work. Mm -hmm. And I'm not enamored with the city. I, I know how to get around. Um, but what that uh, what that allows me to do is immediately walk in and understand that I've got a short learning curve and I've got the relationships already in place to be able to have that impact that I'm talking about. You know, it's the impact that you have to have and you have to have courage as a freshman. You know, one thing I've learned is you, you may get told no. But at least you are asking, and then you keep asking. And and folks in in politics and and members of Congress, I think, respect that. They respect a base uh, base uh, base of knowledge, and the courage to stand up and ask those tough questions. But I think the difference between a a true freshman who can be a leader and somebody who is is still learning the process is when you sit around the table with Democrats and Republicans and tell them both no when they need to be told no because it's not going to positively impact your district. And that's something that I think I can do. Do you believe that uh, the old cliche is that you have to go along to get along? No, I don't. I think anybody that's worked with me over the last, uh, over my entire career, understand that that's not the case. You know, I've worked very well in a bipartisan way uh, with local leaders throughout the, the district that Congressman Shipkiss represents. And before I even got into uh, working into public service, um, you know, I worked very well in a bipartisan way with local leaders and communities uh, to to get things done, and and that's the type of that's the type of leadership that I'm hearing from constituents in this district. That's what they want. They're sick. You know, just like you said, Jim, they're sick and tired of the polarization in Washington right now. They're sick and tired of of no bipartisanship. That compromise is a bad word. You know, they want to see something done. They want to see that new can out there. Because I agree with you, that can's disintegrated. We can't kick it anymore. We just keep kicking each other. It's uh, it's dented, uh, if nothing else. It's a 10:30 a time for the uh, news uh, headlines with uh, Dave Shaw. We'll come back after that and uh, chat more with uh, Rodney Davis and invite your calls at three five six nine three nine seven. Here's Dave Shaw. We're back with uh, Rodney Davis. Rodney is the Republican candidate for uh, Congress uh, in Illinois' 13th district. He'll be against uh, David Gill in November. This is uh, Tim Johnson's uh, seat. Uh, Johnson, as you know, dropped out of the race after winning the primary. We want to keep reminding uh, people about that. That is uh, what this uh, congressional seat is all about. And we've talked about the size of the district, and we've talked about uh, several other things. And if you have questions... Uh, please uh, jump in at uh, 356-9397. Uh, is this going to take a lot of money to win this race? And if so, have you uh, raised a lot of money? Well, it's estimated to cost about $2.5 million by the National Republican Congressional Campaign Committee. And we talked about that throughout the whole nomination process, about the how much this is going to cost. We've, we've been actively fundraising. I made a commitment to... Uh, to people that we were going to immediately hit the ground running and, and try and raise as much as we possibly could to get get to that 2.5 million. I think we've been successful, but we can always use more. I haven't hit you up yet, have I, Jim? Uh, no, I uh, my <laughs> wallet is uh, sealed. 
And when Ed Bond's wallet is open, the moths fly out because it's never been open before. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I want to talk to you uh, about uh, negative advertising here in, in a moment as well. Uh, Ray is up next. Hello, Ray. Hello, guys. I just had a quick question. I wanted to go back to that uh, recent uh, Obama thing with the immigration and the children and what have you. Okay. Uh, I wanted to get Mr. Davis's thoughts on, on the legality of that. Um, isn't there laws in place to uh, be able to you know, make those decisions other than just him himself make that decision? It's the executive order, is it not? Yeah, I believe so. So your, your so, question your question is, uh, is it was it legal what he did? Yes. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's questions anytime a president issues an executive order, and that's why I've talked about uh, executive orders, you know, shirking the role of Congress. And as a member of Congress, I'm going to be disappointed when executive orders get get thrown out there because it means that we're not following the Constitution. And no matter who the president is, I'm, I'm not a big fan of executive orders because Congress should be able to have a say and have a role in, in any policy, not just a policy that, that we're discussing here with uh, with immigration. And well, I agree with that, and you got my vote. Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, this is not uh, unusual, the executive orders. I believe that uh, Bush had uh, quite a few, and Bill Clinton had a bunch. Mm-hmm. I think, uh, so as long as it's there, uh, there's no doubt that they will uh, they will take advantage of it. They will, and, and I still believe, regardless of party, that executive orders, uh, they, they shirk the, the three uh, branches of government. And and I think it, it takes away the check and balance a little more than what I would in, what I would be in favor of. Well, I assume with uh, all this money you're raising, you're going to do so, some advertising. Do you are you a believer in negative advertising? Uh, it seems to work, uh, unfortunately. Uh, people get in there and call each other names and all all kinds of things, and then when they uh, when it's over, they'll all shake hands and and be uh, good friends uh, probably. But uh, nonetheless. Negative advertising is is with us to stay, I guess. Uh, How do you feel about that? Well, I think the negative advertising has led to the perception that Washington's polarized right now. Mm -hmm. And that's why Congress has an approval rating that is (laughs) it's one of the lowest in our nation's history. Um, You know, but that overall negativity and the overall polarization and the fact that the people of this district believe that there's no bipartisanship and that nothing's getting done. It's it's an overall problem in in politics right now, and that's what I hope to change. I hope to be out and meet people and to talk with them, to encourage them that that I'm going to be a leader that's going to work with Democrats and Republicans as I had throughout my career and actually get something done. This morning I was reading a, a story. the The headline of this story is the House vote to hold Attorney General Holder in contempt possible uh, very soon. Uh, the U.S. House could, for the first time in history, vote this week to cite a sitting U.S. Attorney General for contempt of Congress. What do you think about this uh, this whole business about the the Bureau of Alcohol, uh, Tobacco, and Firearms? This uh, fast and furious uh, gun running sting that they call it. Well, what's your opinion about that? Is is he holding back? Or should he be telling more? Uh, and and what kind of an idea was that to get all those guns down there? Well, I think hindsight's twenty twenty, and the unfortunate aspect is we lost uh, we lost law enforcement officers because of decisions that were made in Washington, and that has to stop. Uh, I don't. I'm not privy to the information that the White House or the Department of Justice has submitted to the investigate, investigative committees. Uh, I saw that Congressman Darrell Issa said yesterday that he doesn't believe the White House is hiding anything, but I do believe the Department of Justice needs to produce all the documents necessary so that an effective decision can be made on whether this program uh, violated any laws. Uh, but I got to tell you, Jim, as I travel throughout the 14 counties of this district, you know, they're not talking about Eric Holder. They're not talking about Fast and Furious. What they're talking about is the economy. They're talking about the lack of jobs. They're talking about the lack of certainty in our tax code and, and certainty because of 
unknown health care costs. And those are the types of issues that I'm going to talk about over this campaign. And those are the types of issues that I really think need addressed once I get to Washington. Yeah, but shouldn't they be interested in, uh, I understand those are the top priorities. There, there's no question, I guess, that the economy is the, is the number one, uh, will be uh, the number one as far as the uh, election is concerned. But uh, these things just to sort of come and go. And uh, I think people have gotten to the point where, well, it's another crook doing something. And we've certainly, at the at the state level, had enough uh, problems here in the state of Illinois to uh, to justify people thinking that way. And yes. I think should, shouldn't they be in, in involved? I mean, this is a big deal if the if the U.S. Attorney General is uh, cited for contempt of Congress. No, I agree. With never you. happened before. No, it's a big deal, but it's just not on the minds of the people that I, I talk to. No, they're, they're uh, concerned about jobs. Yes, and and I do believe you know it's working its way through the process. And Congress is going to be able to determine whether or not all the information was submitted and if laws were broken. And if laws were broken, then I think, it, you know, those who broke the laws need to be held accountable. Quick uh, break here, Mr. Baum. Maybe just a couple of minutes and we'll come right back. We'll have another just uh, four or five minutes. Uh, and uh, if you have a question, uh, get in here with it with, uh, at 3569397. Uh, Rodney has uh, some other appointments uh, at 11 o'clock. He's been kind enough to uh, stay through this uh, segment of the show, so uh, jump right in after we take this quick break. Just a couple of uh, questions here. I have a lot more uh, for you, but uh, we'll have to do uh, another one of these uh, sometime prior to the campaign, of course. And by the way, are you going to have any uh, debates with uh, Mr. Gill, Dr. Gill? Well, I sure hope so. And you know, I, I believe uh, as we get closer, uh, we'll start talking about that with this campaign, and and uh, hopefully we can do it here. Yeah, we'll. Uh, I, I talked to uh, Rodney before we went on the air, and I hope to have a uh, a, a program sometime where we devote both hours of the show to have uh, both he and uh, David Gill on, and uh, and talk about uh, the important things in the campaign as we've been doing here this morning. Well, just uh, one final question, then uh, we'll uh, we'll let you go. Uh, you're getting endorsements from several people, including uh, Jim Edgar, who happens to be one of my favorite governors of all time, and not the and one of the reasons being that we were in the black and had a had a surplus when he was there, so somebody was able to do it. But uh, when he endorsed you, the how how important is that? Do people still? follow uh, Governor uh, Edgar and uh, the fact that he said uh, you're the man for the job, uh, is that important? You know, I, I think it is. It, just to uh, just to, to reiterate that there are some folks that have been following this whole process and, and um, you know, are supportive. And Jim Edgar, I, I went over to his house about a month ago now and I sat and talked to him for two hours, he and Brenda, and it was just a great conversation. Got great advice on how to be a better candidate, too. Uh, he agreed to come and and host a, a couple of events for me in my hometown of Taylorville on June 11th. And I got to tell you, the guy's a big draw. We had standing room only at our local VFW when uh, Jim Edgar was there. And I, I'm just proud to have his support. You're right. He, a great governor who made tough decisions, regardless of the impact on how it affected his reelection chances. And those are the same type of decisions that he encouraged me to make as a member of Congress. He's been very, very supportive and very favorable. And I look forward to, to working with him throughout this campaign. He's told me that he's going to give me a call with advice every once in a while. And I just, uh, I'm excited about that because he's been a great advisor so far. Well, he's a he's a terrific, uh, was a terrific uh, governor and uh, still uh, very uh, active, as uh, most people know, I think. Well, Rodney, uh, our time is up here. I'll let you go so you can get downtown and uh, meet your other uh, obligations. But uh, we'll do it again one of these days, and uh, the best of luck to you. And uh, indeed, I hope that uh, sometime uh, prior to the election, I can get you and uh, Dr. Gill uh, together here in the studio. Well, I look forward to that. I look forward to coming back again uh, before then. And I, I just really thank you for having me on and, and thank the residents of the Champaign-Urbana area for listening, and uh, I look forward to getting to know you. We'll take a quick break here, Mr. Bond, an open line until 11 o'clock.